gracious Heavenly Father, uh, just come into your presence once again. So very grateful for your precious word that you've given us to know you, that we could feast upon it together in this format. I just ask that you would filter out anything that is contrary to the truth, but just seal to our hearts only that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're continuing on in uh, part 5 of our study in Titus, chapter 1, verse 16, the last verse of the first chapter, and we'll go on across into the, the second chapter. Uh, hopefully I can make it to verse 7. So the Holy Spirit, this, what we've seen is the Holy Spirit uh, through Paul to Titus concerning those who are, are at Crete, the Cretans, and there were legalists there, Judaizers, uh, law keepers whose mouths needed to be stopped. And we are presented with the all-important reality of sound doctrine, that is healthy truth, healthy teaching. But there are those who profess to know Him. They constantly profess that they know Christ, and they constantly, by their works, deny Him. Uh, they're reprobate as, as it concerns the faith. And I want you to to take, I want to take note here, I want you all to take serious note of the fact that there were no chapter divisions in the original text. So as we traverse uh, uh, from verse 16 of the first chapter over into sec the second chapter, I want you to keep that in mind. So we're going to connect the last verse of Titus chapter 1 with the first verse of chapter 2 and which I believe contrasts reprobate works with sound doctrine. Looking back at verse 1 and uh, verse 16 of chapter 1, they profess that they know God but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. But Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. If their works don't pass the test, then what is the contrary work? Well, it is speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. So what stands in between us and good works? And let me pause here for a moment and just point out something. I think that as we go through this, if not as we go through it, at least by the time we get to the end of it, we need to ask ourselves a couple of important questions. Questions that I believe are, are really relevant to our present study. Because we, we know, and we've all met individuals who seem to meet the description match the description that we're about to look at for older men, older women, younger women, and younger men. And we know that we're not to judge outwardly, but the question that I would present to you for your consideration is, is one that has to do with motive. Why are we doing what we are doing? Why are any of us doing what we are doing? And what was the basis upon which we came to do it? it? To try to put it as simply as I can, there's a huge difference in, in, in a, a person that is trying to obey God, love God, trust God, uh, do what's right. Huge difference in, in one who's doing that for, let's say, his own personal motives, his own personal reasons, perhaps he, he feels like that if he does these things, God will do something. Or he's trying to earn 
merit, and favor toward God. They're not the natural result of God's in-working, God's working in that life. On, on the contrary, they're, they're absolutely works of the flesh. They, they didn't come through the, the, the Holy Spirit. They didn't come through God's Word. They didn't come through healthy doctrine, sound doctrine. They didn't come about as a result of faith. What they did was they came about as a result of, of something else entirely. And I believe that uh, that's an, an important distinction that we need to take note of here. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. We see a, we see a stark contrast in, in verse 1 of chapter 2 uh, from what we saw in verse 16, the last verse of chapter 1. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. We, we know from Matthew 7, 20, a tree is known by its fruit. A good tree bears good fruit. I believe that's, that's describing the new man. A bad tree bears bad fruit. I believe that describes the old man. The word bad there in that, in that text in Matthew chapter 7, verse 17, the word for bad there is paneros. It's an adjective meaning evil, bad, wicked, malicious. That is the old man from which nothing good comes. We know that the flesh profits nothing. God, folks, He works in the new man, not in the old. It is, it is faith resulting from sound doctrine that leads to works contrary to the reprobate works that we saw in verse 16 of chapter 1. Belief in sound doctrine stands in between His finished work and our works. So it is, it is His work And then sound doctrine stands in between our works, which in effect, really, if we are to be honest with, with Scripture, we have to say that even our works are a continuation of His works where that sound doctrine stands in between. I guess, I hope, I hope that, that makes sense. I, I kind of struggle with how to express this, this thought. Which it's actually His continued works. His life lived in and through our lives and that by faith, not by law, not by legalism, sound doctrine, our faith or our belief resulting in the fruit of the Spirit. That's what we're looking at and it's in that order. And I've always believed that faith exercised equals the righteousness of God in our lives. There is none righteous. We have no righteousness in and of ourselves, folks. But there are those out there that can appear to have a righteousness. And there is. There is a righteousness that is, that is not of, I shouldn't even say righteousness. There is a, an appearance of righteousness that is really not truly the righteousness of God that's based on faith. What it is, is it's a, and, and the word, I guess, uh, to describe it escapes me, uh, illusion. Uh, it is uh, a facade. That's what it is. And, and we, all of us have seen that. There are people who, appear to be very upstanding in their community. They never break the speed limit. You know, they've, they've never been convicted of a felony. They've never uh, let, been involved in, in a, uh, an affair with, uh, they're married, they're faithful to their spouse. They raise their children well, okay? And, and in fact, many of the most uh, legalistic uh, some of the most legalistic denominations that there is, you will see just that very thing. And on the contrary, you may see someone who's struggling to rest in Him, to trust in Him, to walk by grace, not law, whose life appears to be anything but that. Okay? And I want you to take note of that. 
as we go through this. Our trust in God lies in direct contrast to our, our taking on the impossible task of spiritual good works ourselves. And, you know, all other works, if it's not, if he didn't do it, folks, if he didn't do it, okay, it's of the flesh. All right? If a work does not come through faith, it's fleshly. You know, in, in which case, you know, you know, we, uh, well, we just, we have no reason to boast. Therefore, the proclamation of sound doctrine, I believe our text is showing us, that the proclamation of sound doctrine, healthy teaching, will result in, verse 2, the aged men being sober. Okay? And what do we see today? Well, I, I look around me and I see a religious system that today that is designed to avoid sound doctrine because it's considered to be divisive. And, and I want you to take note of how the exact same thing on a physical plane, a non-spiritual level, the, the exact, really the same thing has now become center stage in modern culture and politics. We, let's don't offend anybody, okay? Didn't used to be that way. You know, political correctness. And doctrine, folks, is not easy. It's not easy. It wasn't meant to be easy. You, you tell me what discipline that there is out, out there where, the, that it's, where, it's, where it's easy. Okay? The sound doctrine, it's articulated. If you look at it, those of you who are following along in the Greek, it's articulated. This is the definite article of specific identity and this is what Titus is being commanded to give diligence to. This is what he's commanded to give heed to. The sound doctrine. You know, we can go back to Acts chapter 17. We can see where Paul and Silas, they preached at Berea. And the inhabitants there, they received the word with all readiness of mind. And they search the scriptures daily whether these things uh, be true. And many of them, as a result, many of them believed. What is sound doctrine? Well, in, 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 in just me looking at the Greek words, sound doctrine, sound, healthy, doctrine, teaching, healthy teaching. Okay? It's, a, it's kind of a funny sounding word. Uh, hugiaino is the, is the Greek word. Healthy doctrine, healthy teaching. Here's what it's not. Sound doctrine is not somebody's personal convictions as to what truth is. Sound doctrine is not just, well, I think or I feel. And I, folks, I'm, I'm constantly seeing that, hearing that, reading that. Well, I think this is, this is what I think. This is what I feel. And sometimes you'll hear on, on occasion, this is what I believe, but it doesn't seem to be as, as strong as I think and I feel. There's such a, 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 an overdue emphasis, a heavy emphasis on what I think and what I, what I feel today rather than what I believe and what is sound doctrine. Sound doctrine is the Word of God. Sound doctrine is, the, well, that's the location of sound doctrine. That's, that's where it resides, is the Word of God. So we could say that the Word of God is healthy teaching. Well, that, that didn't sound so, so strange. If, if I walked up to another brother or, or sister in the Lord and I said, hey, guess what? Did you know that the Word of God is healthy teaching? Uh, they'd go, hey, amen. You know, they'd probably amen that all day long. But if I, if I said, we need to, to give heed to sound doctrine, they'd go, oh, no, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's divisive. You know, I pointed this out in my previous video that there's power in the blood. There's also power in the Word. There's power in the Word. 
I mean, does your Bible not tell you that His Word will accomplish what God pleases? Mine does. And why would you think that His Word sh should accomplish more than what He intended? Okay? And I, folks, I have seen pastors become nervous wrecks because they don't see people doing what they think people ought to be doing or, or they don't see people living the way that they think that people ought to be living. So I have a passage of Scripture that declares that if, if we are proclaiming sound doctrine, the older men are going to become sober. Grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. Uh, you go on down with the text, the aged women likewise, that, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, uh, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the Word of God be not blasphemed. And I'm going to suggest that such things as these result from the proclamation of sound doctrine. Okay? I pointed out this before. I've, I've told you how I, I do not believe that the Bible is a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life. It is primarily the revelation of the person and the work of Christ that when we're looking at all of these do's and don'ts or how we should be and how we should not be, that we're not looking at law because we're not under law. It was never given, the law was never given to the church to begin with. But we as Christians have died to the law in order that we might bear fruit unto God. And so what are we to do? How are we to handle all of these instructions? How are we to view them? How are we to look at them? Well, we look at them through the reality of the finished work of Christ, the righteous man who lives by faith, and the fact that it all comes and is filtered down through, through healthy teaching. Healthy teaching. Sound doctrine. We can't just set doctrine aside and say, well, that's, that's, that's really just divisive. We don't want to have anything to do with that. And then just set about to, to perform all of these instructions, all of these commands, all of these imperatives on our own. That, folks, that's law. Okay? It comes through a different conduit, a different channel, okay? We're talking about the work of God in our lives. And, and He will not compete with self. You know, it, it, you can do it, or He, or he will do it. There's a, uh, there's a great gulf of difference, grand difference, between what you do in the flesh and what He does in and through your lives by faith. And that through the inner man, the new man. Because he has nothing to do with the old man. So I've got a passage of scripture that declares that if we're proclaiming healthy teaching, then, then the older men are going to become sober. That, that's what I'm seeing. Grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience. Okay? You know, why are there so few who understand God's grace? We, we, many of you have probably been asking that question of your, uh, asking that question yourself for I, I, however long that, I don't know, since, since you've come, first come to know the, the word of truth, come to understand God's grace in your life and how that it, that grace stands in such direct opposition to law, legalism, which, which predominantly today in, in modern Christianity, that's, that is the norm. And how can that be? Why is it we seem to live in a time in which sound doctrine is so scarcely realized, so seldom sought after, why are there so few who understand God's grace? 
Why so great an opposition? Why did God decree it would be this way? Because he's, he's the majestic God of all creation, and he certainly did decree that it would be this way. And the answer, folks, is obvious. If he hadn't, we would never fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in our flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Colossians 1.24 Now, looking at the word sober there in the text, the word sober there means they're not going to be, they're not going to be drunkards. You know, sometimes the, the word sober is translated sensible. Here it means not given to much wine. So they're not slaves to wine. That is, they don't let something else control them. I think you could take that beyond wine to anything that controls a person. Remember what Paul said, that he wouldn't, he wouldn't be controlled by anything. All things are lawful, yet not all things are expedient. All, not all things are profitable. Paul would not be mastered by anything. And, and I want you to remember that back in their time, wine was, was considered a, a drink that would, wouldn't cause sickness. Okay, all right. There was a pretty heavy temptation there back then to drink wine. You know, it was easy to become a slave of wine. The water that they drank, you know, would rust a, rust a clay jar. It wasn't very healthy. Their water wasn't pure. It goes on to say that they're going to be reverent and self-controlled. Now, now, I want you to watch the definite articles. They are going to be healthy in the faith, the love, and the patience. That's what the text says. I don't, I'm not sure how that comes across in your authorized version, but that's what the original Greek, Greek uh, is showing me. Now, somehow in my mind, there's a difference between the faith and my faith. You know, there's a difference between my love and the love. There's a difference between my patience and the patience, his patience. And I think that the text is saying that they're going to be healthy, not in their faith toward God, but in the faithfulness of God. That's what I believe. They're going to be healthy in the, the love of God. Not their love for God, but the, the fact that God loves them. Healthy in the patience of God. And that is where we're to walk. That's where we're to rest. Folks, I've seen lives change dramatically and consistently when the truth of God's Word is brought forth. Is it really that hard to believe that Christ is asking us to recognize that He is always there? He's always there leading us, carrying us forward in life through His own strength, not our strength, but His and that what he desires most, more than anything, is that we trust in him. That we constantly look to him, not to ourselves. Not to ourselves. Where those who contradict sound doctrine profess to know him, but by their works they deny him. Are you an older man, fully persuaded that God loves you? Verse 2. You know, there's a, it remind, this reminds me of a song, a song, why does, there's a song, why does God love me so? I mean, what a, what a horrible, I'm sorry, what a horrible song. The answer is because you're his, the song ought to be, how can I sin knowing God loves me so? That's, that's really what the song ought to be. And I see a whole community, a so-called Christian community, striving to make themselves and others healthy in, in their own faith, okay? Their own faith. In their own love. In their own patience. 
No, folks, I think that's putting it backwards. I've mentioned this before. It's, you know, the whole, it's the whole idea of putting the cart before the horse. You know, we put ourselves before God as it concerns his majestic sovereignty when it comes to the, the, the election of God. You know, we chose God. God didn't choose. Not, he didn't really choose us. We chose him. So we put the cart before the horse. Well, it's really me that lives the Christian life, not Christ in me. Paul really didn't mean what he, uh, that, it sounds nice. Nice poetry, Paul, but not I, but Christ. No, nah, it's, it's really me. It's just, that's just poetry. So again, we put the cart before the horse. And it's interesting to me. It's interesting how the, the same effect from healthy doctrine occurs in old women. The aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior. Now, the, the, the word, that I, I don't like that translation, behavior. The word in the original text is demeanor. Demeanor, the whole mental attitude, the life, the character. You know, behavior deals only with action. But demeanor, as becometh holiness. Now, many of you out there are familiar with the Greek word for holy, you know, hagios. It, it, that's not the word here. The word here is, is heron, the Greek word for temple, which, oh, that's interesting. Not, not the holy of holies, but the outer court where the priest would function. The priest would be functioning in the outer court. Uh, the high priest, he'd go into to the uh, Nios, the, the, uh, the holy of holies. So they're to be priestly in their demeanor. That's what the text is saying. Not false accusers. And the word there is a word that you all, of every single one of you, ought to be familiar with. The word is devil. Diabolos. Diabolos. Devils. And I don't know how many men I've talked to that thought that they married that, that one. Of course, I've talked to many a wife, too, thought that just the reverse. Slanders is the word. Accusing falsely. Satan himself is a slanderer, a false accuser. But that's what the word is. Not given to, also not slaves to wine. Teacher of good things. The Greek says teachers of the good, which I, I take that to mean the truth of the word of God. And what is the result of that? Well, we read on and we see. Verse 4, that they may teach, train, that is, train the young. The word, the, actually, the word woman or women is not there. I think it's implied as, you re, as we read on. The word women isn't really there in the original text. But that, that they may train the young to love their husbands. So, obviously, it's talking about women. To love their husbands. The Greek says lovers of their husbands. Now, the word is phileo. It's not agape. It's phileo. They'll like their husbands. Most, uh, most husbands are difficult to love. So they will like their husbands. And it says to be loving their children... Uh, verse 5, to be discreet, the word there is sensible, uh, chaste, the, the word is pure, keepers at home, the word means home workers, not too popular today, good, agathos, describes what, that the word agathos, the word good, uh, always describes what originates from God and, and is empowered by Him in, in a person's life through faith. Obedient, that is, that's, that's the word, our word, hupakuo, 
obedient doesn't mean to do um, poieo is the word for do hupakuo is the word for obey this is obedient it's submission to the Lord's plan okay to their own husbands that the word of God be not blasphemed it, it reminds me a lot of Jacob and Leah how that Leah was if I think if any one of us had been back then back there back then uh, uh, with uh, and knew Jacob and Leah and knew what was going on we would have probably many of us would have probably suggested to Leah that she leave the lousy sucker you know Jacob mistreated her but Leah was faithful and as a result Jesus Christ came through her lineage so it's obedient that is to be under the hearing the intense hearing of another to be subject to another you know Adam was first formed then Eve there's an order God's this is God's created order it is absolutely not what it absolutely does not mean is that women are wives are to be slaves to their husbands which is how it's often taken yeah, which demeans women and uh, Christianity is uh, I don't know how to phrase this properly or correct there's there is no other religion quote unquote other than Christianity which so elevates women it puts women on on a pedestal as it does okay not not any religion does that more than Christianity verse 5 to be discreet sensible chaste means pure keepers at home and good so uh, this obedience then leads to obedience to their husbands leads to the word of God not being blasphemed I mean what a responsibility that is and I don't mean to suggest I, I in no way am I suggesting that women have a greater responsibility than men but that is a that is a heavy responsibility and it, it is an attitude that grows out of sound doctrine and so we've gone through this we get, we get to verse 6 and it comes back around now to young men young men also young men likewise exhort to be sober minded exhort them younger men exhort to be sober minded I don't know how to do that and you're supposed to laugh at that verse 7 in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works and doctrine showing uncorruptness gravity sincerity and folks whether it's it's I've always thought that the best marriage counseling is the Word of God but it's it's not just that it's it's well I don't care whether it's marriage raising kids you know going through extreme trials difficulties hardships no matter what it is I'm being shown that it is healthy teaching God's emphasis here on is you can take it you should take and highlight find your highlighter and highlight sound doctrine here in this passage that is what it is all founded on okay that's what I find so amazing it's so simple yet it's so profound healthy teaching leads to how a Christian ought to walk the young man folks who doesn't know God can be taught to be sober-minded I understand that I understand that the young woman who doesn't know God can be taught to love her husband and her kids a lot a lot of that's just natural okay older men old men and women who don't know God can be faithful to one another okay and and even be modest and, and to some degree they naturally wholesome in character you know it depends on the generation you know if they, especially if they're of the greatest generation okay but it's as I said in the beginning 
We don't judge outwardly. John, we don't judge outwardly. God looks on the, on the inward parts, okay? And he makes that assessment. And I don't see any place here where, at all where Titus is given any instruction to judge the moral character of those that create apart from, okay? And I, this is, I qualify this statement, apart from the all-important foundation of sound biblical doctrine, healthy teaching, okay? You know, how can there be, how can there be so much boasting in, in, in ourselves here and now when none of that will be seen or heard in heaven? Everything that modern Christianity has built, everything it believes and preaches collapses beneath the weight of one single truth, and that is, unto him be all the glory, now and forever, amen. And you can only say that in relationship to sound, healthy teaching. Apart from it, if you discard sound doctrine, and you, and you look at doctrine as divisive, because it is, it is the very nature of, it's the very substance of sound, healthy teaching, sound doctrine that leads to, that results in, unto him be all the glory, now and forever, amen. You, you strip that away, you take that away, and, and it's not unto him be all the glory, now and forever, amen. It's, it's look at what I did, and you've got to do what I did. And if you don't do what I, I've done, if you don't live like me, if you don't believe like me, think like me, if, if well, hopefully you get my point. Believing that, that, that one must do Scripture and doing it really counts for nothing. Even if, even if you succeed in doing it, because it was self that did it. You know, throw out sound doctrine, folks. Just read it and do it. And I guarantee you, based upon the Word of God, I will, I will be as bold as to say that I will guarantee you that it's worth nothing. Okay? Nothing. Nothing. The flesh profits nothing. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Oh, it, it can have all the appearances of being good. But in God's eyes, in His sight, it is worthless. It is, it is that bad tree. It's, it's, it has the appearance of looking good, but in fact it is evil. Okay? The plowing of the wicked, the worship of the wicked is sin. Believing, believing that it it is self that does it doesn't even have anything to do with Christianity. Self always boasts in self and it credits self with having done it. This is legalism. That's what defines legalism. True spirituality never, never views ourselves as having done it in the first place because we attribute all the glory unto God for having done that work in and through our lives by faith, something that we could have never ever done on our own. We acknowledge the fact that we could have never done that on our own. And we give God the glory, God the credit for having done it. Faith, the righteous man shall live by faith. Faith exercised, folks, equals the righteousness of God. We don't have any, okay? We just ain't got it. The righteous shall live by his faithfulness. His faithfulness. What appears to be law in the New Testament, do this, don't do that, because they are, in fact, commands. They're imperatives. If you're a Greek student, you know that. They're, they're in the imperative mood. They are commands, okay? They're given, but they're given to a church that's not under law. Are you hearing me? Therefore, we're faced with somewhat of a dilemma, okay? But without such instructions, we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't know what our Savior's life looked like. We wouldn't have a portrait of His life, which is said to be our life, not I, but Christ. 
Now you factor into that that it is the righteousness based on faith, that, that, and that's a genitive, that is faith's righteousness. And our dilemma is now resolved. We don't have a dilemma. It truly is not I but Christ, because we were crucified with Christ. We died to sin, self, and the law. It's not simply just read it and do it. It's not simply just go down. You, you older men and you, you older women and you younger women and you younger men, you need to just do this. And if you do, and best of luck to you. And if you do it, God will be pleased with you for doing it. That is not only simple-minded, folks, and the result of, of, well, it's a result of a lot of things. It's a result of, of laziness, of not really wanting to study. It comes about as a, res as a result of some really sloppy exegesis. It comes about as a result of abandoning a whole lot of truth which, un which should underlie it, which supports it, which is the foundation of this. It's, it's, it is too simple-minded. It really is. This is why we're to study to show ourselves approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So the, the Bible is not a book of instructions, as so many believe, on, on how to live the Christian life. That's, I know that's, what, that's probably what 99% of Christianity believes. But it is not. I want to tell you that it's not. That's law. It is the revelation of the person and the work of Christ. And when you factor into that equation that it's those works that he prepared beforehand that we are to walk in, that is the finished work of Christ, now it becomes clear beyond a shadow of a doubt what we're looking at. We're looking at his life, not ours. They're not there to do. That's law. They're there to show us what our lives will be like as we subject ourselves to sound, healthy teaching whereby the Lord takes and brings about the result of that in our lives. And we give him all the honor, the glory, the credit uh, that he deserves. Reserving nothing for ourselves. Nothing. There's nothing. There's not one, one iota of anything that I, can, that I can claim credit for or that I, I should boast in before God. Not anything. So tell me why is that so predominant today in the minds, the, the mentality of most Christians today even those who would shun any mention of the word boast, yet in their very demeanor, that is exactly the type of life, the relationship with God that they espouse. Why is it? Well, God, God knows, and he knows those who are his. And I'm out of time. I want, to, I want to tell you folks I love you all. I truly do. I hope everyone is staying well and healthy. I, I so appreciate your continued prayers for this ministry, for your support. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.